Jose cleared the dining table after I ate to give space for the massive flower bundles that he and his wife were bringing from the yard. Jose and I moved the table to the center of the room before he began to set the bundles upon it. Curt orange marigold, purple velvety lion's paw, and small white tia teeth blossoms, which clustered at the ends of thin radiating stems, all beamed across the surface. I agreed to Jose's request to help cut the flowers. He took a pair of rusty scissors hanging from the corner of the room. We are going to bunch a small group of flowers to about a third of a full hand. Cut the stems at a palm's length from the blossoms. Jose reflected on his wherewithal for the holidays. There aren't as many flowers as there once were. I used to make a double archway for Shantolo because I had enough flowers to adorn both frames. Jose peeled strips of tensile bark from branches of Quach Mekat, wooden cord tree, to fasten the floral bunches to the bamboo posts around the altar. They arched the altar in bands of rustic white, purple, and orange. All the other arch ornaments were foods. Golden delicious apples, oranges, mandarin oranges, nipple limes, macho bananas, and even small bread figurines unique to the holiday. Jose and I tied these together in pairs with thin ribbons of quachmecat bark and wound the pairs along the posts and crossbeam. A wind and a twist of the cord kept the paired items together and tight to the bamboo. These are for the dead, Jose explained, so that when they return to their abodes, they'll take these foods with them. It's something that can't be seen, however. He had a cardboard box filled halfway with pan de muerto, miniature loaves baked into bulky figures of humans, angels, cats, feet, and other shapes. Only the human figures had I seen before. Once complete, the arch was a dazzling bouquet of bundled blossoms and hanging fruits, shaped breads and fanned sugarcane leaves. Motley colors, fragrances, and savors issued from this altar, now befitting for the gods, saints, and ancestors to come. Extraordinary. Dinner was a stew spiced with chili, onion, and tomato, and served with a bowl of black beans and a stack of tortillas. As I was bringing my bowls to the kitchen, my eyes widened when I saw Chela roasting dark cacao beans upon an ardent comal plate, her ancient fingers spreading the earthy husks over the ceramic. Cacao? I didn't know cacao was raised here. The humid lowland tropical forest surely suited it. Maria had bought a kilogram at the market. She, Jose, Chui, and his mother were all in the kitchen with Chela. The sky was then dark. May I taste one? I asked Chela with new excitement. Chocolate, now what for bitter water, is one of the world's most celebrated contributions from Mesoamerican civilization. And at last I could taste it from its native source. Chela gave me a bean hot from the comal. After peeling off the thin, crisp skin, I bit a piece of the blackish brown bean, hot, crunchy baking cocoa. I nibbled off the rest, too bitter to eat whole. Chela pulverized a batch of commercially manufactured Maria cookies with a long stone muller upon a concave corn. She mixed the cookie powder with the cacao grounds into a plastic tub. Maria and Chui's mother added two kilograms of granulated sugar, a three-quarter kilogram of packed brown sugar, and a small bag of ground cinnamon. The three women mixed this compound like witches around a cauldron. Considering how sweetly it scented, there must have been a spell to this brew. Jose brought out a new pot to boil the chocolate in. Chela ground the mix over the quern and then started rolling it into compact balls, each around two inches in diameter. After an hour, she had made around 35. Three balls were enough to boil with the new pot over the hearth. As the visitors drank and ate in the kitchen, I was also invited to take chocolate from the pot and pan de muerto from the altar. Chela scooped the steaming drink from the pot with a halved tree gourd, and she poured it into our small plastic mugs. It was softened with its cookie powder foundation, slightly greased from the bean oils, and electrified with the ground cinnamon. I tapped a cup of the hot drink to my lips. This is the best chocolate I've ever tasted. It was a smooth, earthy blend of spice and cacao, the taste of nature itself. The chocolate balls and altar decorations were from the Mexico I'd come to learn. For more experiences and lessons from living in the Aztec and Otomi villages of Veracruz, please visit shamanscross.com, the website for my memoir. I pin the link in the comments. Thank you for watching, happy days of the dead, and good roads.